So hey everyone, I'm Black Down from Key Sound, um, and we have a kind of a special collaboration we're doing this evening. I've got my friend H here, uh, Harriet, um, a DJ I'm a big fan of, and really been enjoying her music and her contributions recently. So she started a label, and we have a release coming out called um, uh, Rollers Live Volume One uh, Nightfall. And I thought because they're both happening roughly the same time, it might be fun to chat and say hello. So over to you, do you want to introduce yourself, say hello to everyone? Um, I'm H, I run a collective, I guess you'd call it, called More Cowbell. Uh, we started off as a Facebook group and we've kind of just grown from there really. Like now we've, we've just launched a label. We literally announced it this morning. <laughs> so it's all very, very fresh. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, so one of the reasons I thought it'd be fun to do this is because I've been, well, you and I, this share a similar musical like niche right so yeah. it's something that we've both been interested in and it feels like it's growing quite a lot at the moment so for people who haven't joined the more cowbell group or heard me go on about 130 or rollage can you kind of say describe roughly what it is or what it isn't i guess it's everything in between <laughs> like <laughs> it doesn't really have like a place it's kind of like a mix of every influence of every electronic music genre that you could think of. Except trance. Um, we rule trance out. I, I, yeah, I'm we can rule trance out. <laughs> um, but like it's it's kind of somewhere in between like dubstep, techno, garage, breaks. Yeah, it's kind of hard to place. It's not really got a genre that it kind of fits into. But this is okay. This is actually over over the years I've been watching musical scenes, always where the fun stuff is. Where yeah. there's enough structure that you that it like you you can kind of understand vaguely what it like one track relates to the other but not so much structure that like every track is the same so um you're launching a label which sounds like madness uh, having someone who uh, someone i've done this for a long time uh, tell everyone what you're doing when it's happening how that come about um so we've just signed our first guy hasn't been announced who it is yet we're holding off on that for now of course. um but we have Kind of release that we're launching a label um we've got two tracks in the works um one of them is very kind of uk garage influence kind of rolly bass lines um and then the second is quite interesting it's so weird because i can't like place it it starts off as like uk drill and then it kind of rolls into like uk funky and then the kind of techno-y kind of side of things. Look at that, especially that second one, I want to hear that now, so I'm going to have to harass you. Yeah. About <laughs> Definitely to, especially the drill angle, which I, I've been uh, very keen to listen to. I've been keenly listening yeah. to it. I'm quite sure how it fits into our actual sets. I yeah. love that whole UK drill sound. Like there's something about the bass lines in that sound that really yeah. resonate with the stuff that we kind of play and that we push. Yeah, the gliding 808, that's the one thing that stuff has. And it's quite possible that already comes from U the US drill, but that slightly atonal weird pitching glide thing mm -hmm. that is like a signature sound. Um, love it. Definitely might try and steal that in the future. <laughs> we put it in a different context. And that is the fun thing about 130 and the sort of energy around it right now is that is there's a degree of open possibilities of, okay, we know it's clearly not house music and it's clearly not explicitly straight up techno. And it's, you can hear a garage tune when you, when you hear one, but that's kind of not exactly mostly it. But then there's a lot of all that interzone like creativity where anything's possible. Um, and it seems to be kind of flourishing. It seems to be a bunch of people going, oh yeah, we probably can do anything we want. Yeah, I think it's good because the whole reason that I started the More Cowbell group was because I couldn't find this sound anywhere like easily. Like the only people really pushing it were you guys at Key Sound and like a couple of other small labels like Circular Jaw. Um, but I couldn't, like, it, it wasn't really a thing. So I was like, well, how can I push this and make this, like, more of a thing that people want to make or they want to listen to? People get a bit funny about tempos and they say, oh, why have, you, why have you picked a tempo as a constraint? And it's like, I do have an answer for that. The thing is, I think that tempo allows a really interesting, uh, like, balance point between groove and drop. So when you get much faster, you either get into half step, dubstep, or even like, I mean, drum and bass is essentially half half time, right? 
and kick snare, kick snare, all that. It's really hard to do anything that's for the floory or shuffly or more percussive. And if you get slower than that, it's really hard to do anything that's half step, like 120 BPM, then you do half step, just really sludgy. But that sweet spot at 130, you can kind of play with both. Like you can make people dance and then you can make, you can have massive bass drops and have that impact and that flight or fight feeling. And all of that's possible at one tempo. And it's kind of a magic sweet spot for me. I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly 130, though I do tend to write it. But that, that's like the answer roughly of why, why that one? Because by the time you get to 140, it's hard to do sweets to swing it stuff and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the rollage, the rollage nightfall thing that you guys are doing is a perfect example of that. For people that haven't, you know, we haven't really talked about it a lot yet and it's coming out, but Dusk and I have done a project and it's not exactly an album and it's not exactly a mix and it's somewhere in between. And we really love the old Fabric Live CDs. They were really cool statements, creative statements as DJs and really permanent. Um, I've got one over there. Uh, but yeah, that now everything's just on SoundCloud and it's there and it's gone. And it doesn't really feel like it's a permanent statement anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't really press enough music to a record. So we were like, we've been working for two or three years and but like, like, this isn't an album really. It's because it's dance floor stuff and whatever. So what, how can we present this to people and show how like, excited we are about what you can do at 1.30? But also have something that's a little bit more lasting. Like I'm just going to do a mix. I'm going to put it on SoundCloud. A couple of thousand people listen to it, then it's gone. So it went round and round in my head. I was like, "This is what we've got to do. We've got to do something that isn't that works on Spotify and Apple Music, but yet flows like a mix." Um, yeah. And that's what we did. We'll find out if we like it. Yeah, I mean, as well, the fabric. The f going back to what you said about the fabric live mixes like they they're you know uh like a staple in electronic music history really aren't they the thing is that cds are dead and the people really don't want to buy them and you can't it's complicated with licensing on spotify right so it's not your track as a dj and you're putting it on spotify then how's that working um but this is we made all this music so that we got around that uh, yeah. you know, some, of, some of the things like Shackleton's Fabric Live is all his stuff, but most of them are not. They're like it's a, it's DJs selecting stuff. Yeah. So we could do it that way. But equally, we because we wanted to sort of like in actions rather than in words, sort of show, like, you know, sort of have a go at showing how much is possible at 130 from like from ambient weightless stuff to half step to like percussive jersey kicks to mad jump up difficult stuff and MCs and vocals and all this stuff, but all like it's all one one curve. And so we're just like let's let's just mix it all together. Um, we wrote all the tracks, and then we went and got them mastered, and then we uh, uh, got into uh, got the chance to mix it in the main studio at Rinse, and. Uh, the funny thing was we did two takes, but as we listened back to the second take, we realized we'd missed a track off the first take. Oh no. <laughs> well, it was all perfect. After all that planning. So there is really only one complete take. And um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of pr quietly uh, really happy that it's, it's not done in Ableton or Logic or Cubase. We did it in the Rinse studio. We did it live. We didn't edit it. We didn't fix it. We didn't stitch up later. It's been mastered but it's one live take. And then it's I mean, chopped up so you can hear it on Spotify, but it's one honest take, which I'm not sure I've ever done that before. I mean, that's the kind of the point, isn't it? Like to, to show people that it can be done. Um, there are lots of mixes out there that get done on Cubase and Logic and Ableton and, and because they're perfect because they are permanent statements. But yeah. I, think, I think honestly, I would have just stayed in the studio until we got a good take. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> But it was kind of nice to be able to do it in rinse. Um, they, you know, that someone else's show was going out on air and the, the, the main studio was empty. And so we got a chance to do it um, where you and I played though. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully people can click on it, you know, on Spotify and it, it comes you know, down to individual tracks, but it, like an album, 
and all tracks written by us or remixed by us like an album, but it flows like a DJ set. Um, and so that's that's the plan. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's not. But um, I th actually, we actually have a second one planned. But this one is the dark one. Um, and I, I've got to recognise this is diabolical timing. <laughs> well, have you got even more really tunes to put out for a second one? I haven't finished them all, but we paused like polishing those. But basically, two clusters of the like this. There's this clearly kind of particularly dark metalhead Z angle to one thirty. And I thought it would make more sense to mix them all together. There's moments of light in there and, and a little bit of colour, and that's fun. I want it to be completely like monochrome. But that uh, if this works, there's a second one we could do that's like much more Detroit strings and colour. And... That'd be cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes DJs with very clear sonic direction, I think they make sense to people. Yeah. Like a lot of these iconic DJs like Youngster and LTJ Bookham, who just have a sound. Yeah, this is the thing. It's a sound, isn't it? And yeah. I think that's what really, like, if, you, if you're looking at all of the DJs and producers that are, like, iconic, they all have a particular sound that they are drawn to. It's not necessarily, like, a genre. It's always, like, a vibe or a sound. He is to make that sound as flexible as possible while still being the sound, and that's just really hard. And I think Youngster and Bookham are um, people who really focused on one sound and there's probably other DJs that go wider and for a long time Dusk and I basically tried to join different clusters so phases 20 minutes of this and make the transitions and we will still do that because I'm interested in the diversity and the possibilities of 130 but this particular mix is predominantly fairly dark it varies in intensity like whether it's weightless or half step or like totally jump up but um, it's predominantly got this sort of darker side running through it and what about you? I, you're one of the, my favourite people I've DJed with twice now in the last couple of years because you always keep us on point with the selection. I always think, <laughs> what is that tune? Which is like my highest compliment. Uh, so um, when you, what sort of stuff are you enjoying drawing for? Why, why do you pick tunes and not others at the moment? There's a certain vibe and a certain sound that I'm always drawn to. There's something about like them rolly bass lines that really, really draws me to tunes. Um, I mean, I, my first like things that I kind of fell in love with in, you know, club music were UK Garage, Ghost Recordings, LB. Um, and that's really, I think that's really shaped what I play and what I listen to now. That was a real epiphany when I think we, that's even after we'd done our first set when we came to your radio show on Seoul and that you and I talking about Garage, it's like, I don't actually personally want to be a Garage DJ, but swing and, and skippy stuff and shuffle is like deeply embedded in how we, Dan and I yeah. write tunes so that they're not stiff and not like rigid. And, and you were like talking about that as a key component of your DJing, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's interesting as well because my boyfriend listens to a lot of dubstep and makes a lot of dubstep and I've never really been that involved in the dubstep scene personally but I just there's something about like I don't know if it's the tempo or what but there's something about the space between dubstep drums that doesn't like click in my brain as it does in his <laughs> whereas 130 and like the shuffle like you're saying about like the shuffle of yeah. like garage drums and how that translates to 130 there's something about it that just kind of clicks in my brain a lot more i think i think that i don't know if it's brain though so this is this is this is the distinction for me i i've always felt swing is actually like a physical thing so it's it's this will start as a very nerdy sentence but like <laughs> writing tunes if you start if you start with all the stuff on the grid and then you start to swing things around it, there's a point where you're like, okay, this is completely rigid. And then suddenly I can feel my shoulders going and like, it's actually asking me to dance rather than like telling me, like forcing me to dance. And I feel that's like, that's the essence of why that stuff works. And it can be applied to anything, but like, it's basically funky. Right? And yeah. even if it's weird, dark, alien, cold music on top, which is the essence of ghost, right? Like, that alien metalhead sound with the swing but then it's just it's still 
fundamentally human, like funky, and it's like asking your body to dance. Like it's got this sort of asymmetric pattern. So like I always think your body's kind of odd as it flails around, and that's what that's why I get really sort of uninterested eventually in certain types of very grey techie stuff at the moment because it sounds really cold and very stiff. So anyway, that that's a long boring monologue about swing. Yeah, if people are watching now and are curious about one thirty, <laughs> there's a bunch of, of stuff that can be done that's different like drop and groove and uh can be listening music and work on a dance floor it can be vocal and it can be instrumental um and these things often are oppositional like people do one or the other i do like chill out music or i do club bangers i do like i'm all about big drops or i'm uh all about the groove and i'm going to build the groove or all those things I, I don't do vocals or whatever but I think all that is possible. Like it, 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 it makes sense if you can do it, do it together. So yeah, I, uh, I encourage anyone who's out there and is curious and not, doesn't want to make something that matches, pattern matches to house of techno to come and yeah, join more Cabo and just experiment, see what you like. Can you describe, we talked there a bit about your swing and so on and, and your influences. How, you know, how does the more Cabo label for you play out what, what would you like to where would you like to take it i basically want to build off of what we've already created yeah there's so many producers that send me so many tunes and i and they're so sick and i'm like why isn't why isn't this anywhere how do you feel about project management because uh <laughs> i'm very organized <laughs> i am actually very organized i quite like it <laughs> well, I mean, any really well. creative endeavor there's basically a spreadsheet and uh People like Will LV tease me endlessly, but if you don't, like, honestly, that, that is just a reality of, like, labels that still exist. <laughs> volumes of spreadsheet data. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm quite enjoying it. <laughs> but going back to what you are saying about, like, what I see the label as, I kind of see it as, as a few things. I don't just see it as, like, the music. I also see it as the community which I think is really important having Sorry. built off of a Facebook group, which has what, almost a thousand people in it now. I think that that really needs to be integrated yeah. into the label. And also like the artwork and stuff is going to play a really integral part in the label. Yeah. You seem to have got to get a handle that um, with like, you know, cause the sort of seen the assets for the night that we were supposed to be playing together um, and that was like, okay, I see that, got that. That's actually a really hard problem to solve. It's not something I particularly enjoy solving well as a, as a label owner, it's like all the visual side of it. You just, I got into this because I care about music, but you have to express it. And I suppose that slightly um, leads me into a question I was going to ask related to this. So you also have a background in film and, and video and so on. Mm -hmm. um, in 2020, both of us as DJs, what, fundamentally we're trying to express ourselves through sound but you have to express yourself visually online. Yeah. So how would you advise, because of that, like, you know, video is the unit of distribution of stuff, social distribution. How would you advise either DJs or other artists coming through now to kind of think about the visual side of things? I mean, it kind of ties into what I was just saying about like, it not just being about the sound, it's almost like an image that I have in my head about the way that the sound looks. I have like an image in my head of how things are gonna look and sound. And I kind of try and translate the sound into the image of what I'm gonna put out on socials and stuff like that um, through the medium of video or through graphic design. Um, yeah, I'm quite lucky that I kind of, have that video background so I can use it to put up things on on socials um but I would just say if anybody wants to put things out on socials like content just like try and use your creative brain and use people around you as well that might be graphic designers or whatever to kind of help you out yeah it's really part of it isn't it for the label we're basically going to do prints because we so Basically, because we're releasing digitally, yeah. uh, we're not releasing vinyl. 
I don't think people really buy vinyl and 130 that much. I don't think there's really a market for it. But I really love the aspect of artwork on vinyl. Like that's what makes it so great, I think. Yeah. Um, so instead of releasing vinyl, we're gonna release digitals, but then release artwork prints with the digital releases. Um, so we've got, great idea. we've got a, an artist working up uh, a piece now. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're gonna release like a limited number of prints. So there's gonna be like 30 prints or whatever for like a tenor. Um, and when you cop the tunes on Bandcamp or whatever platform, you can then add that to your basket and yeah, get a print. And there's only gonna be like 30 of them per release. People are having to be quite creative with that, the formats now, right? Like here's me trying to find a fabric CD that works on Spotify. And here's you trying to basically do vinyl without all the thousands of quid expense yeah. capital. And because people do like physical stuff. We did a tape once and, you know, I did a book once, um, you know, there's lots of effort, but I suppose it is nice to have something physical. And, you know, we're in, all in isolation at the moment. So, you know, I, I just, just rediscovered old records that I've had because I'm here loads. And then you think, yeah, because I, I, I physically kept them and I, they're, they're permanent. Yeah. You know? It's nostalgia, isn't it? It's nostalgic to look at, a piece, it's just as nostalgic to look at a piece of artwork as it is to listen to a song in my head. Like there's so many, like, vinyl covers and stuff that I'll look at and it will remind me of a certain time. Like the Ghost Recordings label is a perfect example. I think it is a really integral part of it. It's hard though, and I, I think you're completely right. The hard bit is that most people go into music because they like audio <laughs> and then they have to basically, to, to get that audio out there and they now have to express themselves visually. And there's, it's also that you can draw more attention to yourself with the visuals than you can with the audio now. And that's the challenge. Um, so I, 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 I constantly try and rethink it all the time. It's tough, um, but it is, the way, it is the way things are. At least if we can yeah. self-publish. There was a long point where it was much harder to self-publish. It's because as well, like obviously music is a lot more accessible now, isn't it? Um, so I guess you kind of have to do stuff like that to kind of stand out from everybody else. A lot of it also then extracts back to value. Like what, what is it that you actually care about? What these values are like for me, Releasing records is not a good way to make money. It's a good way to lose money. It's a good way to lose time. Uh, it's a good way to often get like, you know, just get tied down in endless like, logistics. Like as much as it sounds like a great creative endeavor to run a record label, most of it is project management and logistics. And so you just have to think, what is it I really, really care about? And it's like, if that's releasing the music, then, then everything else makes sense. If it's not releasing the music, then you just might as well just have an Instagram page about something else. <laughs> so that's that, that why of it all still works for me, even though that getting to finding people and, and, and getting the message out there is a bunch of visual effort. Yeah. Um, Do you think that that's something that you've kind of done with key sound? Like there's a particular image that I think that you guys have, but it's not necessarily, it's kind of weird because it's not necessarily like a logo or anything like that, that I think of with you guys. It's a feel, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very photographic and we were very like tight inspired by Nico Hogg's photo photography and you know it came about just when I was trying to solve this problem for the first time like in 2005 it was like how how do we visually express what we're trying to do and you know, a bunch of things came together I was sort of running around London and you know, going to clubs and things and I was I mean you know I was taking random photographs and it was always like sunset or these points of like really maximum intensity that I really enjoyed. And our music is also like part listening, part works in club and it's part not too dark, not too light. And like Dust chose his DJ name because it's literally not too dark, not too light. And I was like, and these things that we, key sounds like originally designed were like the idea was, it was like a, a piece of audio that like grounded the music in a, in a context, in a place. And so we just sort of like key sites being like photographs that also ground it in a, in a place um, because it's music inspired by London's pirates and it's like bass music from London, it's not bass other music from somewhere else. And so we tried to use those photographs as our visual identity. Um, and we've had to expand that. So sometimes you know, that's like any things you try and prod it, see where it breaks from the core, which is kind of exactly the same as 130. How do you get in the middle of it and then push out and see how, until it falls over um but 
yeah, I, I find it really hard to find photographs that fit, but when I find them, I really know. And I actually took the yeah. photograph for the cover of um, um, of Rollage Live Volume One. Um, I took it in Corsica um, because Corsica Room Two is just such a special place. Um, and yeah, but then we just flipped the color palette because the the palette fitted much better the way the music felt. Yeah. Um, so I sort of feel like it's honest. Like I I was stood there surrounded by speakers and uh, taking that picture like that's that was you know it's personal for you and it's it makes it more genuine and organic you know that way yeah, and we couldn't really do sleeve notes because we weren't doing a physical thing but on, on I got a variant of the picture and we kind of did the shouts so like talking about recording at Rinse and there's a great producer at Rinse called Andy Hackney who really supported us and sports us at the Key Sound Show and he helped us like record the mix um, there and then um, you know, Jason Transition, legendary dub, dubstep mastering uh, engineer, um, mastered both the tracks, individual tracks, and the whole thing as one. So it was nice to do these little shouts. And I, I can't print that, but I'll put that somewhere on online so people can see it. Let's talk a little bit about um, the samples in the Nightfall release. Yeah, so Dusk and I really like sampling voices. I think... Um, sometimes electronic music gets too detached from humanity <laughs> and it's and I, that's that kind of i love the sort of paradox of it being machine music we try and find humanity in and little pieces of voices and fragments of voices are really like helpful to add that humanity to it and it just doesn't become too cold and too clinical and so on um so Dusk and I often go and find vocal samples um, and little bits, and they can be used more like instruments, whatever, but I always try and embed them with meaning. And one of my bugbears with electronic musicians is often that they have great, uh, they do mean things by their track titles and their vocal samples, but they never explain them. Um, and they say, oh, it's this great mastery and you've got to imagine it, whatever, but actually the meanings get lost. Like tracks like B by Mallow, a very early release, He's told me that specifically meant something. Why? Well, I mean, it's not really up to me to like, explain it, but like, he's you know at the time he was like this. You know, what? There's a reason why B is called B, but you know, it's he's just never chosen to share that. So I, I kind of feel the other way. Is like I'm quite happy to talk about some of the reasons why some of these things are. And there's a whole bunch of vocal samples in this stuff. The hunger's got that sample still hungry, and that one is something I found, but. Um, it refers to the, the the drive and the energy it takes to keep writing music because like it takes a millisecond to share something it takes a millisecond to listen to it now like an album is one click download all these things have become instant the value of music is near zero to everyone but it still takes ages to write music mm -hmm. so like it takes that hunger so that's that, that's why i put that little sample in there there's key sound session anthems turns up twice on the mix and that's got a sample of rico when he um, when he came down to a key sound night about five years ago, and one of um, Wen's Margate lot filmed him doing, filmed him doing a on a reload, and he's sort of shouting out in the crowd. It was a Khan and Neek set, and that made I used that in a sample because he's talking about the key sound night and shouting me out. So that was pretty fun. Um, there's another track there that's exclusive to the mix called um, Flex, um, and there's this um, football podcast guys that we cross paths with sometimes at rinse and they just go in a room and yell and argue about football really loudly for an hour and uh we just couldn't resist sampling them <laughs> and uh, <laughs> because it's got this like like actually we just use little fragments so like if you think about i'm not really a breaks person very much but there's a classic think break it's got that little vocal hip hiccup in it it's like this little like Oh, it's not Rita Franklin, but it's like a little piece of a human voice in it, and it just loops around and hiccups in a really funky position. And we try to take these football dudes and like with their kind of energy, where they're going, ah, good. And there's one in the <laughs> like, only well. And uh, I have no idea what he was saying. We shortened it to it didn't mean anything, but it added that like humanity to it, like a little bit of human voices. And we it's tried funny to... because I feel like that is key sound, like that that whole like chopping up vocal samples and making them into melodies is exactly what I remember key sound to be and I also think that it 
It's really interesting because that's how I envision like the London sound. Multiculturalism yeah. is really important and voices are really important and language is a very important part of multiculturalism and like uh, and slang is really important and a very expressive thing and, and so all that stuff is a, is a really fertile thing to use and I think I think we Dusk and I over indexed too much for a while on like stuff that was a little bit kind of thoughtful so it's the vocal like the football samples are just like they're, they're the feeling of them they're not like they're not, they're not saying anything I literally want guys saying Ollie Woe or something I don't know you know <laughs> I literally love this it's so good. <laughs> but, but, but they they have an expression to them and, and they're and they're from communities and you know they're, they're a black group, bunch of dudes from East London that argue about football and they sound like they're yeah, fighting it's the other, context, but they're really isn't it? It's the yeah. context of the samples that mean more than the actual words of the samples themselves um, and the yeah. backgrounds of the people in the samples. It's both there's examples where it is like literally the messages. So um, the cycle and the information, which are sort of like twin tunes on my last EP. One there's like there's definitely more I need to break the cycle and then everyone says now that but now the information is there and both of those are about um inequality and like like people having the opportunity to research stuff and move themselves out of the situations that they're in and so like I need to break the cycle or now the information is there that you can kind of uh, find ways to to change your circumstances so I do try to put like these quite at times hopeful fragments in rather than just like some dude yelling and it's like the drop the bass is going to be loud and then the bass comes in loud <laughs> so just try and work you know when i see stuff that i find a resonance with i'll, I'll add and there's another one that on there's a, i put my otic remix on which is one of the madder things i've done because i just sort of chopped up the raw audio for most of it and he's got a sample that says um uh a lot of it is the easy way out um, what makes the most money right now this is what's going to get you on radio club play co cookie cutter ish. Um, and so he's sort of, it's a vocal sample, but railing against people making formula music. And then just as it comes into the drop, I added this, this like sample from like uh, a grime MC just, just saying no, like yelling no, as if to like one sample is talking to the other, like saying, no, 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 like that cookie cutter shit. No, we're not interested in it. And then, the remix is completely demented so <laughs> definitely it's never going to be a uh, club play radio play pop star so um yeah I, I enjoy that it'd be interesting to talk about other artists stuff we are really interested in um i'm really excited by spectral sound who uh, were known as malunga sound until recently um they're really peaking the output they're doing um uh, you know i'm really interested in what otek's doing um, Kellen 303 and Lifeform. Lifeform just put his album out on Key Sound, and then uh, Kellen 303 had an EP before, and they've been collaborating together on some quite cool stuff. Um, and Denim Audio seemed to have a really high output. Um, Jay Shadow doing, is doing some really crazy stuff. Um, so is Ebb. Um, Vermin and Miller just constantly blow me away in terms of the production they're doing. They just, you know, they. Um, you know, they need to write lots more music, but like it's always amazing. Um, I'm really interested in what Munir is doing at the moment. Um, yeah, he's he's unbelievable. Every time he sends me a tune, I'm like, I keep IDing tunes in your sets, and I was like, what, what's that? And it's like, oh, it's a Munir tune. <laughs> yeah, it's because I literally play his songs constantly. Let, let me flip that around then. What about you? Uh, what what DJs or producers are you enjoying in your set? Again, Spectral Sound are really doing something. Like there, there's something about their tunes that is very like garage inspired kind of 130, which I love. I think Pluralist is really doing some crazy things right now. Carter, I think yeah. he, he really kind of has that like, he's got that like Walton kind of sound to him where it's quite percussive, but also like, yeah, it's quite driven by drums, but it kind of still fits in that like rolly bass line kind of drop stuff. Kind of territory, yeah. yeah. Um Yash. We had Yash play at our keep hush. Um She's cool, right? She's like it was it was weird because I 
I booked her and I've never really seen her. Obviously I've listened to her production and kind of really rated it. So I booked her for the Keep Hush and I've never seen her DJ out before, but she blew everyone away. <laughs> like everyone was like, who was that? Like, she's amazing. It was so, so sick. I would highly recommend if anybody has a spare 45 minutes to go and watch that back on the Keep Hush YouTube because it's honestly such a sick set. What, what was it like curating that, um, that Keep Hush? It was really cool. Like it was, it was amazing being able to like handpick people that I've been listening to and that and like really, really rate um, and put us all in a room together. Cause it was the first time as well that all of the more cowbell like crew have actually met like loads of us have never even met we just talk online all the time and like send each other tunes or mixes or whatever but it was the first time that we were all in one room and that was really amazing as well as like being able to curate the lineup and like show people what the sound is about because there's a lot of people that I know that are kind of more from like a dubstep background because Charlie my boyfriend he's really heavily involved in that scene so a lot of his friends came down and if any group can get it the dubstep lot can i'd love to go wider like i've been putting like afrobeat samples and stuff i think that drill reference you're talking about is like, really interesting but like the dubs people who are open-minded about dubstep and understand the roots of dubstep era stuff should yeah. really get what we're trying to do it's yeah because it's kind of like a post dubstep sound in a way isn't it yeah, I mean, not, it's not literally the genre that is post dubstep, but it's something yeah. that evolved out of that. But I, it's just as, as much influenced. Like, if you look at what Janessa and Jellybean Farm and Squain are doing, they, they've got a, like in their balance a lot more indexing for techno in, in it. So, you know, that that isn't explicitly dubstep either. It's just a sort of like a related cousin take on what on that's doing. And mm -hmm. you know, I, th I think a lot of it depends on how much you want to focus on groove and percussion and how, how much you want to focus on drops. Um, and I'd really like to zigzag between them because <laughs> um, I think it's a really interesting thing and it actually it affects how you make tunes um, yeah. but uh, yeah they, they should all be able to coexist and you know, partially for me it's just memories of things like third base where a you know, foundational DMZ place that where in one room all these sounds could come together Mallers percussion and energy D1 sort of trancey half step, Code 9 sort of irradiated since, Koki's mad jump up, Loper's half step dread, but it yeah. would all fit together in one narrative, um, in one tempo roughly. And that was really a nice balance between being distinct enough and like made sense together, but was totally diverse um, or diverse enough. That was kind of my thinking as well when I booked the Keep Hush. I, I didn't book, book any artists that were two people that played the same kind of 130. Everybody went in with completely different sets and I think that that's what made it so great. Yeah, I also hope that um, uh, as a sort of side message we can sort of say it's great to book female artists on this. So there's an opportunity there just to sort of lead by example and say this, anyone can get involved. So we've kind of, for the nights, we've kind of opened up our opening slots to female DJs. Like I kind of want to just leave that opener just for female DJs, just because I feel like there's a lot of female DJs that never get booked as like residents or they don't get booked for the opening slots. A lot of the people that do get booked that are that gender are a lot bigger. Right. We needed to do our kind of bit and, and use that spot. So we can encourage people to be like, hey, look, this is a thing. S send us some mixes and we'll put you on a lineup kind of thing to encourage people. I think it's important to send the right to say the signals that anyone can get involved. So it's yeah. important. And funnily enough, today that we're recording this, I should be completely hungover and totally exhausted because last night should have been the second secret location rave with loose lips, which you would have been at um, and what well, I would have been at. And um, I, we, it was quite clear as we're coming into a while back, we, we probably weren't going to do this. So I didn't, I didn't say this to you, but what I was going to say is that um, my plan for that was that you, me and Dustwood should all kind of basically co-headline it. 
because I thought that would be really fun. So oh my God, that would have been so fun. <laughs> Why have you told me that? <laughs> because we'll do it next time. Yeah. Oh my God, that would be so fun. Yeah. You, I, I think that I think the selection would have been deadly. If, if, yeah. Yeah. So next time, let's just do that. Um, whenever we get like out of isolation, and I think there's going to be the, some of the maddest explosion of energy. Um, <laughs> there's going to be so many parties. <laughs> I think they're going to, the government going to have to be careful with it because the second they say it's okay to come out, everyone's going to really go for it, and it might make it worse really quickly. Oh God! It'd be interesting to talk about how this sound and this thing that you're pushing with key sound has evolved since you began we started key sound in 2005 because no one else would put our music out the labels we liked respected didn't click what we were doing and i said it's that diy thing of like well if you want out go do it yourself and i think for a while you know at those times that's just before the real creative peak of dubstep so it was a bit more tied to dubstep and grime and those things but then you know by the time Skrillex and the gang got involved. We were just really turned off by the whole thing. Um, and But wanted to find something to react in a positive way. Either you say, I'm really annoyed that my this beautiful thing we've been involved with, or both Dubstep and Grimey, but Dubstep got more, much more ruined. Um, this thing had been kind of really destroyed and taken away from this, like literally, t like literally a room of us hanging out, listening to tunes for from 2001 to 2008 like there were 50 people or less for seven or eight of those years and so um i thought well we could either be really negative about this and just complain or we can be positive about it and express ourselves through music and find new creative ways and when uk funky came along i was like this is really cool this really reminds me of garage um but it's kind of its own thing we were like, well as it was ever how can we find our own twist on it and i just thought you know, just in very simple terms, like LB was one of the people that maybe want to make music. His, his like inception idea was the metalhead sourness with, with the garage groove. And I just thought, well, if, that, if UK Funky's there, there's a similar twist that's like crazy drums, whatever, but with that metalhead sourness. And just started playing more 130 on our rent show and less, less 140 and 138. And then there was more to it though, because if you, that description I was describing earlier of like third base and like that really fertile period of 2006, whatever with Maller and Kokino's people, that diversity is also possible. It doesn't need to be like UK funky at 130 that's darker and that's just all we do. It's like actually that creative spot, like I don't do this because it's a good way of making a living. I do this because it's like, what, look at the creative things that are possible, like it's interesting. I don't have anything to prove, I just want to try and nudge the boundaries and see where I get to. So it, we just kept chipping away at it. And then there was a kind of an, a flowering of it for a while with sort of that when etch, um, uh, sort of Paris era, era of stuff that suddenly that, you know, those, those EPs were really well received. And then those guys just generally decided to go yeah. off in sort of different other directions, which is totally cool. Um, um, but I never really thought the idea had run its course. I just kept seeing angles like, oh, we could do that. It did not run its course. This is right. the thing. I feel like it never blossomed as much as it could have. Yeah. And that's why I think right now is so important. If you look, like, there's, like, that's the... This is how we roll and like a lot of this levels sort of classic detroit techno and stuff and then this level down here is mostly like jungle and drama bass it's like those things existed before all this stuff so i didn't have any need to go and be a techno dj or play techno because i already love those records but they're already a, like there's nothing to contribute there like the what is all the format it was like you know it's 1985 when that stuff started so it's like for me i was like but I can see a way to contribute creatively to this 130 thing. If you can get around the fact that it's not one thing, but it's a beautiful space to make whatever you want, um, especially if it's got a kind of a slightly London bassy underbelly. Because, I mean, if you just go and make a house tune at 130, it's going to be a little bit boring. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, and I, I do admit there were periods in, in the last two or three years of real doubt. Like, I'm not sure 
anybody's listening, I'm not sure people are seeing the possibilities, which is why I was just so excited when I, you know, someone just said, oh, you should post this in more cowbell. And I was like, whoa, okay, there's this group of people into it. And, and it felt like it was much more like minds. There's also other, other groups that are doing stuff that isn't 130 exactly, but like all like the more time and all those drums and stuff they're doing and connecting with people from South Africa and Mishimo and like, that's just other angles that just fluidly fall into what this is. It's, yeah. It's that's really... why it kind of felt right to make that group and make, like you said, a space. Like that is the space that we're talking about in a way now. It's like a digital space for it and for people to converse about it and share tunes and collab and whatever they need to do. I mean, I remember it was probably about a hundred people and now it's yeah just south of a thousand yeah <laughs> you know it's got nothing on the identification of music group but like uh that's probably fine like i yeah, i'm good for that yeah it's, it's not it, these things don't need to be huge they just need to be like creative and interesting and distinct enough though and i mean people should know where you where you could chose the name from as well right yeah so it's a few things so the yeah. so it's the walton obviously the walton track more cowbell if you haven't heard it 100 percent go listen to it it's a banger um but also like i can remember back when swamp 81 used to do their well they still do their shows on rinse now don't they but um when i was about 18 i was probably really into swamp when it was kind of emerging in the scene and I can just remember on their rinse shows, Chunky just used to spit over Mike all the time, like that needs more cowbell <laughs> if there wasn't like that 808 like cowbell sample that you would hear in it. The great paradox for me is it's it's also if you're taken literally a really housey thing. Like more cowbell is like, you know, you, you got some house tune and then and there's the you know bits or sixteen bars in when the cowbell comes in and goes mad. It's like actually yeah. not really that much to do with what we're doing, which is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. um, and even for me, rollage as well. Like talking about the term rollage is one of the words that I really liked about it. Rollage sounds like it's a particular percussive decision, and it and it kind of is. It's like oh, you know, people like Burial will talk about rollers, right? Like tunes that just roll and roll and roll. And we do write those tunes, but also we write tunes that completely interrupt the groove and they're massive drops, or they try to be, or they they fall into half step or less or and so yeah there's no great word and then always people say a 130 what a silly name why would you name it after it it's always been a placeholder in my term in my, in my thoughts even when I first used it on my blog about 10 years ago but you got to start with something otherwise people like they don't people even won't know what you're talking about otherwise will they that's the thing because it doesn't have a name because it's so in between everything you kind of have to place it in a bpm how else would you identify it to people? And all the scenes ever have come from this interzone moment. Yeah. Not, I don't know if this will be a scene. I don't really care, like, because it, it, it's created off on its own terms right now. But it's definitely true. That's where these things have always come from, splintering off to something that exists. And a pattern I've noticed in the last two, three years is so much of all the stuff that's just been fallen back to the existing big mega genres, house and, and techno and drum and bass and and rap and reggae and all these things like it's like feel like that stuff has just got more and more concentrated and less stuff between the between the grooves um between the See, i think it i think it is a scene already like whether it's like big or small doesn't really matter but i think it already is a scene and i think that you can like just look at like the amount of people that are sending 130 tunes that you speak to on the regular and stuff like that like i think it, it's already there